Daniel chapter 6, you know, uh, the story, this story found in Daniel is uh, probably one of the best known and best loved stories in, in much of the Bible. As a matter of fact, it was one of the favorite stories for us kids when we were in Sunday school. We would learn about Daniel in the lion's den, and it was a fun story for the Sunday school teachers to tell as well, too. Also, you may not be familiar, but oftentimes, back, especially during the days of slavery, uh, this story was sort of a, of a, of a basis for some of the, from the spirituals that were, uh, that were uh, written and sung by the slaves during that time. Um, it's also been a story that has encouraged people for many, many years. And, you know, really, why shouldn't it? It's a, it's a story that's sort of filled with some unexpected uh, twists and turns. And, and for those of us who know the rest of the story, we know the good guy wins and the bad guys, well, they just say they get torn to pieces in the end. But along the way, as we look at this, we will also learn the secret of Daniel's success, how he somehow managed to survive and to thrive in a very spiritually hostile environment. And this is really kind of a good, good place to begin because Christians live in a world of spiritual hostility. When there is a temptation to compromise our faith, uh, that we battle every day. Some parts of the world, standing for Christ means suffering and death. In America, it means probably more ostracism, ridicule, scorn, being left out, and maybe being just passed over for some, some things in life. It will oftentimes lead to tension as we go through our everyday lives. And another thing, the book of Daniel tells us here how to live for God in this hostile environment. We see how Daniel did it. It also helps us understand some stuff for us as well, too, because he has a great example. He is an example that shows us that can be, it could be done uh, in spite of the hostility. The story reminds us that there's a spiritual battle raging all around us. 1 Peter 5, 8 reminds us that the devil himself was like a roaring lion who would devour us if he could. Some of you know, as we've talked about it on Wednesday nights particularly, I've been involved with some other, other pastors as well, too, in helping one of our younger pastors out at Three Points in um, west of, um, of Tucson who has, um, who's had death threats in his community. Uh, and so there's a young pastor with a five-year-old wife, five-year-old daughter, two-year-old daughter, and a new son about to be born next month. And the neighbor says, I'm going to put a shotgun to your head and blow your brains out. Yeah, it's come to America as well, too. Ray Pritchard, a Bible study teacher, says this, You can tell a lot about a person by the quality of his enemies. And Daniel must have, had, must have been a good man because he had the right kind of enemies. The people who hated him were not friends of God. They came after his faith because there was no other place they could find fault in him and they had no answer for what he believed. Now, as we, as we take a look at this, I want you to remember two facts as we think about this today. We started in Daniel several weeks ago. We come now to Daniel chapter 6. Uh, last week, we said he was about 80 years old. This chapter, he's about 85 years old. Uh, he's an old man. And still living out his faith. He came to Babylon as a teenager. All of his life he had spent serving in the courts of different 
pagan rulers now that he's about uh, 85 years old. Second thing, he's serving under a new king. This new king is Darius, who has a new king. It was not the Babylonian Empire anymore. It's the, it's the Medo-Persian Empire. And uh, the names may have changed from when we started this book, but the spiritual challenges have remained the same. So the question is, will he remain faithful when the pressure's on? As this chapter opens up, Daniel is about to be promoted to a higher office. Darius had recognized him as a, as a person of integrity. He wanted to make him second in command over the entire kingdom. And this is sort of when the intrigue part of the story begins. The administrators and the, and the satraps, these are gov like provincial governors, tried to find grounds uh, in his conduct of government affairs to, to just to knock him down, to, to, uh, to eliminate some of his leadership. But they weren't able to do that. They, they could not find any corruption in him because he was found to be trustworthy. Uh, he was not corrupt. He wasn't negligent. So what these guys come they begin to scheme among themselves and what they're saying is, you know what, we're going to never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So this is where we pick up the story, Daniel chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. And no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in the connection with the law of his gods. You know, when, they, when they begin to look at his life, they found he was faithful in, in all of his duties, what his, what his job was. He, no, nothing wrong with her. He was faithful. He was faultless in his character. And one thing else that stands out about Daniel's life, he was fervent in his prayer life. And those are certainly three marks of godliness even unbelievers could say. Being faithful, being faultless, and being fervent in duties, character, and prayer. You know, as we, as we live our life, the people around us can watch us and tell what kind of a person we are. They know what kind of character we have. And if they watch us long enough, they'll know whether or not we have a strong prayer life or not. Because whatever's in our hearts is going to come out sooner or later and people who don't know the Lord, even those who don't know the Lord, will still find out the truth about us. In Daniel's case, even his enemies had to admit that he had no glaring weaknesses. Horace Greeley had a saying that um, Harry Truman used to like to quote. Greeley said, fame is a vapor. Popularity is by accident. Riches takes wings. Those who cheer today may curse tomorrow, and only one thing endures, and that's character. Daniel was hated because he was successful and he was godly. Now, the one flaw that Daniel had, he was utterly predictable in his daily prayer time. He prayed every day at the same time, there in the same way, so his enemies begin, as they begin to plot and to plan against him, they begin to say, you know what, this is how we can, this is how we can get at Daniel. We know he does this every day without fail. I'm sure you've heard this question. I mean, I heard it back probably in the 60s when I was at youth camp. So it's been around a long time, but it's still appropriate to ask today. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? 
But when they arrested Daniel for being a man of prayer, the evidence against him was simply overwhelming. He was guilty of being a man of prayer. So these guys come up with a plan. Look at verse 6. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. This is what they were saying to him. You know, it's it's trying to butter old Darius up. They come to him and say, O king, how would you like to be God for a month? Man, for 30 days, everyone's got to bow down to you. No one can pray to any other God. You are going to be God for a month. Well, certainly that appealed to his pride. Who wouldn't want to be God for a month? I've heard some of us say, if I could be God for the next day, and you know, you'd, you'd probably do something God would really wouldn't do, but if you could, you would, right? Say, uh-huh, because you know you would. You, you probably thought that at some point in time. Well, in fact, I've heard you say it, so anyway. Well, the problem was Darius signed the law, knowing that it could not be repealed, not even by himself, but he had no idea that Daniel was the target for what these guys were wanting to do. Meanwhile, all these guys, these bad guys, they're chuckling and they're laughing among themselves. Man, they said, man, that, that was a good plan. We have, got, we have got the king signing off on this. And now then we know that Daniel's going to keep on praying just as he's always done. That he is going to be a victim of his own character, of his own integrity. And he's going to be faithful to God. And uh, we've got him. Now, if he had been a flaky believer, a hot and cold type person, this, this plan would not have worked at all. But his troubles, you see, came not from his weakness. His trouble came from his strength. And so, now then, Daniel has to think about, what are you going to do, what am I going to do when, when I discovered here that the enemies have passed a law aimed at me and I'm the only person? It's like Daniel was beginning to realize, I have got this big bullseye painted on me now. As I go through my life. So how do, how do we respond at that point? When we know that we have a bullseye on us because we are Christ followers. Because we are believers. Well look at how Daniel responded. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Or some translations say, just as he had done before. For these over 80-something years, Daniel has prayed three times a day, and every day it was the same. Wherever he was, he stopped and prayed at 7 o'clock in the morning, 12 noon, and at 5 p.m. Like clockwork. His daily routine revolved around three times a prayer. Seven o'clock, noon, five o'clock. Next day, seven o'clock, noon, five o'clock. The next day, seven o'clock, noon, five o'clock. He never varied. Matter of fact, these guys probably could have set, if they had watches, they could have set their watches by his prayer time. For him, prayer was like breathing, and he wasn't about to stop praying because there were some 
snot-nosed governors threatening him. After all, here he was, 85 years old. He wasn't, he wasn't going to live forever. And we have already seen that Daniel wasn't afraid to die. So it was no big deal. He just kept doing what he knew he needed to be do. He'd go home, kneel down, face toward Jerusalem, and offer his prayers to God. And he did it knowing that sooner or later his adversaries were going to catch up with him. Now we need to think about this. As believers, if we stop praying, the world's going to stop bothering us. The world doesn't care. The world cares when we continue to be faithful to God and continue to do those things that we know God wants us to do. Daniel simply could have, you know, he had some other ways he could have done. He could have closed the windows and those guys wouldn't even know what was going on. Or he could have done maybe like some of us would say we would do. You know what? I'll just lead, I'll just lead in silent prayer here. I'll just do it in my heart. And no, no one will ever know what I'm doing. Or he could have thought, you know what? This is only for 30 days. I can wait this out. That's no big deal. But no, Daniel kept on doing what he had been doing all along. And one writer points out this, and I think it's very interesting. Daniel's room was really the lion's den. That's where the battle was taking place. There in his room, in his prayer time. And we think the, the miracle the, the, that Daniel survived a night with the lions, but the greater miracle was that he continued to pray when his life was on the line. He continued to be faithful even when, when the enemies came up against him. So what do we do when they, when they call for the lions for us in our days? For one thing, we don't change a thing. We keep on doing those things God wants us to do. We keep on serving the Lord. We keep on doing right. We keep on living for Christ. And then we let the chips fall where they may. My friend Zach, who is out at three points, and that man is, says, I'm going to kill you. You know what Zach is doing today? He's standing in his pulpit, and he's preaching the word God gave him. You know what his little wife is doing? She's standing up there with the guitar, leading the church in worship today. Keeping on doing those things they know God has called them to do. Now look, let's pick up the story again, verse 11. Well, these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. And they came near and said before the king, conquering concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered and said, That thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, No, O king, that is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Darius now realizes he's been tricked. He likes Daniel. And he immediately begins looking for loopholes to find a way to keep from him being thrown into the lion's den. But even the king could not repeal his own law because that would make him look weak and ineffective. So, so the law had to stand and Daniel had to go to the lion's den. But notice, Darius is rooting for old man Daniel here. Look at verse 16. And the king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. And the king declared to Daniel, 
May your God whom you serve continually deliver you. You know, that's a great testimony of Daniel's faith. Even the unbelievers recognized his faith in God and respected it. So Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. It was a very crude and effective form of capital punishment during that day. And when people got thrown in the, in the lion's den, no one ever got out alive. And certainly not a guy at the age of Daniel. And so many would have thought Daniel was just as good as dead when they threw him into that, into that pit. Or so they thought. Notice three things that Daniel, they were, I guess we call them Daniel's did not. He did not try to escape the consequences. He was willing to be obedient to God. He did not know what was going to happen. He did not make a deal with God to save himself. He was faithful. Well, that night the king didn't sleep well, but Daniel slept like a baby. The king, up in his room, he tossed and he turned. He paced the floor. He refused to eat. As soon as he could, first thing in the morning, he rushed down to the lion's den, hoping against hope that Daniel had somehow survived. You know what this says to us? It says, when all is said and done, it's better to be a child of faith in the lion's den than to be a king in a palace. It's better to be faithful and in God's care, in God's hands, than to be away from him. When Darius went to check on things early the next morning, look at verse 20. As he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Boy, the, O Darius is, is cheering for, for Daniel to come through. He recognized the genuineness of Daniel's faith. He recognized that Though he wasn't a believer himself, he hoped that Daniel's God was going to deliver him. Of course, Daniel answered him and says, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Then the king commanded Daniel to be taken out of the lion's den. Verse 23 tells us why this miracle happened. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded Daniel be taken up out of the lion's den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. And look at this. No kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. That's why that miracle happened. He trusted in his God. Nothing fancy. For over 80 years, Daniel's faith had rested in the God of Israel. And this wasn't going to change even at this point in time in his life. Daniel kept on trusting God, and the result was the lions couldn't touch him. Now here's something for those of you who are taking notes. Write this down. Put it in your Bible someplace. Faith believes God even when belief is unbelievable. Faith trusts God even when belief is unbelievable. Notice how the story ends. It ends very quickly. Verse 24. The king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones into pieces. 
you would think people would learn it is not a good place to be to be the bad guy in opposing God. They were the ones who lost in the end. Then notice what happens, verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and before fear the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to no end. Pretty amazing words to come from a pagan king, isn't it? I, I don't know. Maybe he's not a pagan anymore. We'll find that out when we get to heaven. We can't make that call from here. But maybe we shouldn't be surprised to find Darius there. Quickly, as we close, here are the lessons that we learned today. Daniel shows us it's possible to live a pure life in the midst of a pagan world. There's always a way to obey God if we want to obey God. Second thing we learn, Christians who live for God should expect opposition. It's going to happen. Daniel had his share of opposition, and he lived a blameless life. And if we're going to live for the Lord sooner or later, and it seems like in our world today, probably sooner, trouble will come our way. This is... This is in part of what Jesus meant when he says, take up your cross and follow me daily. Third thing we learn, God can use us to touch unlikely people when we are faithful to him. We've seen throughout this book of Daniel how he made a huge impact for good and, and on the mightiest men of the world. Here, here's what we need to remember, folks. As we go out the doors today, we go to our homes, wherever we go into our community, uh, stores or restaurants, out and about in our neighborhood, we must remember we never know who is watching or what they're looking for. But this story also teaches us that not every unbeliever hates Christians. Not every unbeliever hates us. For every knucklehead out there planning our downfall there's Darius keeping an eye on us hoping that our faith is genuine so we must be careful what we do must be careful what we say fourthly God is able to deliver his people from the, any danger they face you know who the hero of the story is it isn't Daniel it's Daniel's God that's the hero of the story and that same God that rescued Daniel from the lion's den, that same God is sovereign over those who may plot against us. So we need to take heart. We need to continue to trust in God. He can deliver us from whatever we are facing. Then God always, fifthly, God always delivers in his own time and in his own way. Does God always deliver his people? Yes, but not oftentimes. Maybe sometimes it's not the way we think he ought to. Not all of our prayers are answered the way that we want to pray them. But in the end, we must come to the point to realize that, that, that God is good and is probably very good that he has some veto power over some of our prayers. Sometimes God overrules us because he sees the bigger picture. He knows that he can glorify himself some other way than rescuing us from maybe a difficult situation. And lastly, this morning I would say this story ought to be a great encouragement to us because we do know and we learn that God sometimes does deliver in amazing and miraculous ways. You know, in the days to come, we'll face hostility in one form or another because we are Christ's followers. 
And if you're going to be, make the commitment to serve the Lord, you're not going to have an easy road in this world. But be of good courage. If we will be faithful, God can lead us to touch many people's lives if we continue to be faithful to him. Will you join me in prayer, please? Father, one thing that we've learned through the book of Daniel so far that it's not an easy road for us to walk if we're going to be faithful to you. Sometimes a road before us, a path that's set before us is, is difficult. But also, Father, this is what we've learned from Daniel. That my life, our lives, are in your hands. Because we know that all of our days are appointed by you. As we're faithful, as we're obedient, as we walk together through this life, Father, I pray that you would help us, that, Father, we would have the faith of Daniel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.